the record, I don't want to be Joe Rogan. Neither yeah. do I. No. Why not? I don't know. DMT and elk meat and... I'm good. What's DMT? Get into isolation tanks. You don't know what DMT is? It's like so dimethyl is something. Yeah. Is that a drug? It is. It yeah. is a drug, yes. And so you take... It's like it's like, uh, like a psychedelic or it's something? It's a psychedelic. That's what they have in like... It's called ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. Oh, oh ayahuasca. That that's starts that, with an A. That's th That is something I... That's like one of those middle-aged <laughs> life goals is to go to Peru and <laughs> have some ayahuasca. guide in the Andes DMT, and be like... <laughs> DMT is like the active So you want to, before you do a psychedelic for the first time, you want to climb a mountain? <laughs> exactly. I'm going okay. to go all in. Okay. Cardio, <laughs> I have my estate done. I'm you good. You want to <laughs> climb something you can fall off of and then take psychedelics. <laughs> yeah. You have to commit to it. You're on, the, you're on, once you get on no. the ride, you're committed. I mean, I've never taken a psychedelic before, but I really, really think I want to when I'm an old person. Because like, like, it's great. Because when I took something now, I would trip about like, legal cases or like marketing <laughs> yeah. or metrics. Hey Noah, do you know what time it is? What time is it? It is time to talk about death and taxes. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to Let's Talk About Death and Taxes. On this show, we talk about death and taxes. It's in the name. It's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, my name is Noah Chrysler. I'm um, Steven Schreiber. And I'm James Champlin. And uh, Stephen and James are both attorneys. Uh, Stephen has a background in estate law and, uh, you know, probate issues. And James has a background in, uh, like, criminal defense. And he was a public defender for a long time. I'm going to have you guys explain it so that I don't butcher what you guys have done with your lives. <laughs> <laughs> what have I done with my life? Um, <laughs> it's like, oh, no. Um, but I'm, I'm an attorney. Obviously, I own modern estate planning. Um, we do estate planning, probate, um, anything related to helping people get their shit together and then sorting out the mess after um, someone's died. Um, I've been doing it for about, November will be nine years um, practicing mostly estate law. So, um, sweet. And, uh, and I've been an attorney for about eight years. Um, I'm the new associate here, so I'm relatively new to this field, but uh, I was a public defender for about two years. And prior to that, it was uh, legal aid, uh, doing a variety of things, primarily helping out folks that were going through domestic violence. So I guess you could say my background is just public sector. Cool. Would be the best way to put it. Sweet. I feel like the energy of the room changed very significantly. Oh, that's about law. It might have been like an existential yeah. moment. Hey, for some ex reason. Explain what your, have I done with my life? Yeah. Explain yourself, but keep I, it light. I, I meant it as a joke. Yeah. Oh, like, no. I was like, oh, what am I doing in a yeah. profound yeah. way? I, I, I did a workshop where I talked about what I was, my business and future plans. Like, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> am I right, changing my We went too deep. Um, home. I love it. On this show, we answer questions from the the internet particularly avo.com um, which is like a cesspool of bad legal questions of people that have really poor grammar and some of them are great and really informative. people who need to hire a lawyer exactly <laughs> and cut out the middleman <laughs> yeah. um, so we do that but on this episode we're also going to uh, feature feature we're going to talk about things from the news because I mean if you have been awake for the past I don't know a couple of months uh, everything is crazy and the world is burning um, quite, quite literally actually at the moment mm. too was uh, it we're in it. September 2020 yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly um, so yeah yeah, I thought it would be fun to kind of do an episode where we talk about some news stories, but we're also going to throw in some AVO questions as well. It's going to be a fun little mishmash. I'm also going to jump all over, so we might do a news thing, and we might do a question. It'll be great. Um, cool. We ready? Yeah. Let's do it. Yes. Um, our first news article comes from Fox 5 Atlanta. Um, it says, payroll tax holiday is not free money. Atlanta. For some of you, your paychecks might be bigger because of President Trump's new payroll tax deferment, which started September 1st. But you really need to know that this is not free money. If your employer participates in this presidential executive order, yes, you will have a bigger paycheck for the rest of 2020. But starting January 2021, you will have to begin to pay it back. Um, Atlanta-based CEO Oxygen Financial explains this is how it works. The president set forth a blah, 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 blah. You got to pay the money back. What are you guys' thoughts about that? And what are you guys' thoughts about the current or, you know, the, the preceding uh, COVID relief stuff um, as well? I was going to clarify also the legal rationale behind this is that the president, the executive branch cannot raise their own money without Congress. So they can't actually cut taxes, but they can defer collection of the taxes. Oh, cool. So what okay. Donald Trump has done is, so you say, I won't collect payroll taxes until next until the end of the year but you still owe it he can't waive that obligation without congress and congress is not inclined to do it because 
candidly, it's a, it'd be a, it's a dumb policy to cut payroll taxes to fix unemployment problems because the only people who pay payroll taxes are people who already have a job. So, it, um, so without having been said, it's a dumb policy, and I will punt it to James to add in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I could see this being a bit of a benefit for a small term, for a, I'm sorry, for a small business owner, um, where that like, especially people who have maybe a low margin, mm -hmm. right? Like this like could actually make a difference right now um, with the hopes that things get better at the start of next year and they're in a position where they can pay it better. But I think that, I, I don't know how much good that's actually going to do. And I think that there would have been much better ways to actually address the needs of people that are being affected by COVID. I think this is something that uh, the executive branch could do without any oversight from Congress um, and maybe keep it in place through the election. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's what you think. It's kind of yeah. a grab for votes. Not like absolutely. A, yeah. And okay. the, absolutely. If you're an employer, it's a medium to long-term problem if your employees opt into this, um, partly because I have no the employer has no guarantee the same person will be working with them in January than in like September. Yeah. What, so what happens if in that the employer stuck holding the bag? Really? So someone ha so when I uh, as an employer, all right, so when I run payroll, I pay. There's two sides of the payroll taxes: the employer side and the employee side. Mm -hmm. um, the employer pays both, but. On the employee side, this gets subtracted from your net payment, but I but the employer takes makes care that it gets gets the government. Um, so, if an employee, let's say, quits on December twenty fifth with the payroll tax done, the government will still go back to the employer because that's where the money comes from to pay the payroll tax. Gotcha. And in theory, what would happen is. If the same person's employed, the, the employer would just deduct more money out of future paychecks um, to pay the payroll tax loan. I'll call, I'll call, more yeah. or less like a loan. Unless Congress comes back in and forgives it, which is – I assume that's the game of chicken he's trying to play on it. But what he's mostly done is scare employers away from offering it to their employees. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't from from an employee standpoint, like reading an article like that, right? Like, I don't, I don't think that would ever make sense for me to do to take a temporary loan for no reason because I already I mean, theoretically, are, it's a, theoretically it's a good idea if you were, if you took that yeah. money, invested it, and beat the market. Sure, but I mean, the market right now is like <laughs> tanking. But I, I guess I think what a lot of people are looking at or beat the interest too, rate of the yeah, or you you take that and you set that aside for something like Christmas. Yeah, especially okay. for somebody who maybe yeah, is is but, has a lower income and has kids right. you know, even, this might make yeah. christmas easier but even cynically if you took that money put it in a savings account and had to pay it back later you could keep the interest growth yeah that is correct but um <laughs> which is it'd be like know. 12 for a lot of people yeah, 12 bucks, it's, a, it's bucks. very small <laughs> right. what the money would be in interest <laughs> yeah. but um, in theory though it is like the government is kind of offering you interest free loan but it's so poorly done like everything that seems to happen that it's of no gain to anybody yeah. um that that is super interesting though i didn't know that the president can't just like raise funds that's like against a the, or the or the legislative branch can mm -hmm. congress can create new revenue cool which yeah. is the president has so much discretion in his management money it, does, it won't feel that way mm -hmm. um but he can defer like collecting taxes this is a dumb question he's so legally bound to eventually get the money yeah Having said that, the government's our rule of laws in the case of who knows what will happen. But right. yeah, this is a, this is a stupid question. Um, um, I feel like since like executive orders, like our executive orders, a relatively new thing, or has that happened like all throughout history? Oh, like, uh, it's, it's it's always been a thing. It's, it's been always a been a thing, thing generally. The use of yeah. executive orders has skyrocketed in the last like fifty years, that, and that's what I thought. Too, and and right? I also feel like it gets more. It's been getting more press lately because it's. Because we're in, well, that's just the state of our media currently, is they're always looking for something new to make a huge deal out of. Yeah. So they're focusing on executive orders a lot. But, and I think one of the, I mean, one of the reasons also is that, like, there's historically been an impasse between Congress and the president yeah. over mm -hmm. s many legislative things. So the president will attempt to govern by executive order instead of trying to pass a law. Right. And one of the fundamental reasons of that is that the Senate has a, filib has a filibuster and we can't. 
simple majorities can't pass laws in Congress, so Congress is deadlocked, and then the president tries to do things to have the perception of action. Yeah. But am I crazy? Many things they do can actually act. They can they can lift regulations. They can they can impose or lift regulations or modify them. And a lot of the regulatory state is honestly a lot of things that impact our lives. Mm -hmm. It can be done by executive order, but it's still not law. Okay, Congress can pass a law and overturn that more effect more or less. I feel like when I was a kid, and again, I, this is a, this is why I, a, I preface this as a dumb question. Uh, like as a kid, I feel like there was it was less common, uh, you know, to like see executive orders get passed, and it was more so like the president, you know, introduces a law to Congress, and then like Each. sees if it gets. Smashed it was somewhat common then. I mean, it was common then, but it's exp it's. I think it's dramatic. The multi. Uh, God, you were, you, when did you grow up? And then uh, I was <laughs> born in ninety six. Okay. 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 I was almost and, voting. And <laughs> as, <laughs> as as a young child, closely watching for executive orders, yeah. you didn't find you, much. You didn't see much. <laughs> okay. But the, okay. The, but each presidency, like Obama had, like Bush had a lot. Then you Obama didn't? had more than Bush, and okay. now Trump has more than Obama. Okay, so yeah. it keeps so going up. Each it's getting more and more normal as the country gets more and more politically deadlocked. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. that's kind of scary. So what will happen? The, the, the filibusters will mostly go away when the Senate either gets rid of the filibuster or one party is able to govern. Yeah. Um, regardless of which party it is, I don't. I, I, try, I do care which party, but w when one party can govern, then we'll see more laws and less fill, and more um, less executive orders. More laws, fewer executive orders. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Let's shift gears. Um, here's a question from uh, the internet. Um, it says, what happens if we all die? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I'll let you finish that question, but that's a funny <laughs> premise. This is a, this is a legal podcast, not a theological podcast. <laughs> yeah. So, but that was um, a, yeah. Uh, yeah. I set up a living trust back and. Uh, Blah, blah. I set up a living trust and backup will, naming my three minor children as beneficiaries. If one day me, my husband, and all three children die at the same time in an accident, what happens? Um, both my parents and in-laws do not live in the U.S. If none of me, my husband, or children survives, I want our estate to pass to our families in Asia. Um, what is the best way to set this up in my living trust? And also, you know, if this person didn't have any other family, what happens at that point? That's my so, question. The upside of a living trust is that they're generally amendable. So what the, the, the quick answer to the, their question would be to draft an amendment to their trust that adds their family members as backup beneficiaries. Um, and if they're in the US and their family's overseas, they may wanna appoint a um, corporate or professional fiduciary or trustee um, at that point so that the money, it, it makes it easier to manage the money that's in the United States and organize it being moved overseas. Or honestly, depending on the type of situation, a lot of people with foreign family members, or family members in foreign countries, they want to keep the money in the United States because American banks might be safer than the banks in their country. So, but that was like a good game plan. You can do you can do anything like that. Okay. If they don't amend their trust and they die then it will f probably fall to their nearest heirs, barring anything else, if there's any other language in it. If the heirs are in Asia and other countries, does that matter or not? No. I mean, geographically, it doesn't make them less of a beneficiary. It makes it logistically harder to find right. them, yeah. mm -hmm. um, especially if you don't identify them in the documents. Um, you've, you've mostly created a, a difficulty for whoever your, your final trustee is. And hopefully all your trustees aren't dead, too, because then, to, then we'd have to go to court and get a trustee appointed. Which isn't a big deal. It's just uh, another step. Yeah. Mm. But if they have those, do you really need to sit back down with their estate attorney and get all these edits put in? Mm -hmm. And it sounds like they, if they, if they put together their trust themselves from like a kid or something like that, they want to run that by an attorney anyway, just to make sure that they've done it correctly. And, and this is something where you can have that benefit of of your bat your your I guess your last line trustee being a corporation or, or someone that's not going to you know not an individual who could theoretically die with you in an accident yeah hmm. okay. that way there is a backup that's yeah. always going to be there so you're talking about like a, um, barring that company going bankrupt or something yeah and they've yeah like a like a big corporate trustee like yeah. an, like a most banks have a wealth management division that handles trust um major banks tend not to go under that often or like a major trust like okay. US trust or Northern trust and like that. You just want to make sure that 
Honestly, if they, but if they do cease to exist, you might want to update that in your documents too. I mean, I guess yeah. they could merge or do something else if we're not happy with yeah. the new company to change it. Um, Absolutely. Cool. Okay, so so but if everybody a dies, problem. <laughs> yeah. So so you can amend the trust to say, hey, you know, if everybody dies, this is what happens to the money. Yeah. Um, but if everybody dies and you don't amend the trust, you, they just look for the natural error, the next In all error. likelihood, based gotcha. on, I'll look at the language of the trust, but for the most part, they typically default to natural errors. And if that error is in a different country, then it becomes a lot more difficult. So it's probably a good idea to like let people know, like, hey, like, put that if, in your trust. If everyone yes. dies, like you should, you should come looking if, for if money. Here's where it of, should go. Exactly. Yeah. If they're already thinking about this problem, then they can fix it right now. Yeah, so certainly. they already know who they'd leave it to. And if they wanna, don't want to leave it to anybody, if all those people are dead, um, like there's a simultaneous death, like an accident or something, mm -hmm. um, they could they could pick like a nonprofit, a charity, or just any organization or some one thing to give it to as like a final backup. Okay. Like if all their families are dead, but they really love their medical school or their undergrad and they want to leave it to them or the humane okay, society that, that, that they makes more sense because yeah. I was like well, why would I give it to like Exxon like I don't know why I would give <laughs> you, it to a company you no, no. To Exxon <laughs> if you're really you into their that. gasoline <laughs> yeah. if you're really into giving rich really rich people more I money I really like well, their premium unleaded so I gave it to Exxon <laughs> well yeah the, the Exxon additives really cleaned out my carburetor much more effectively and I felt like it, it gave me more time with my car that I really liked and I want to leave yeah. them part of my estate yeah. <laughs> because of that yeah. it. it was very meaningful I'd like to them to name a pump after me <laughs> that would be amazing do you think they would you think yes no. this is oh, I'm, I'm really cynical I think all of our franchises you could definitely get a franchise Ex owner for the right amount oh, of money oh okay yes to like yes. engrave yes. your name on a pump I was and thinking it might be surprisingly low you're right I might, I might be like I might be like I'll pay for the engraving or or I'll just bring my Dremel tool I was gonna say if you have a Dremel in. tool you can oh, here's twenty dollars can I drill my name into but your that, pump but that would be illegal do not do it get their permission you have to get their permission yes, if, first, they're like, yes. if they're like here's 50 bucks to etch my name into your thing is it cool with you and they say yes give them the sign <laughs> yeah. put it in paper put, put it in writing but then knock but yourself the, out the owner of the franchise yeah whoever owns not, that not just the person behind the cash register yeah, yeah. But if it's like a corporate-owned gas station, you, it'll yeah. be hard. You have to go through a lot more hoops. Gotcha. I think they'll take your money. So I guess to answer the question from the internet, yeah. um, yes, with enough work, you could get a gas pump named after you. <laughs> yes. Or get your label maker. Yeah. I think of all the ways I could do it. Yeah. My husband's really big on label making. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Get that. Um, okay. We're going to shift gears again. Here's a headline from the news. Okay. Police identify suspects in triple shooting in DeKalb County Waffle House. Uh, when we were prepping for the show, I said DeKalb, which is Ugh. bad and terrible. And now I, uh, yeah. There's probably one some Gross. other state. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. I hear DeKalb a lot. Like the yeah. Cobb County and then DeKalb the County. It's oh. like, that's not even spelled the same. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, no. yeah. Police said one of the people injured in the triple shooting early Thursday morning is at Waffle House in DeKalb, DeKalb County <laughs> is being named as suspect. Police have also identified a juvenile as second suspect. Uh, the early morning gun battle began. Um, the battle sent three people in the hus hospital, according to DeKalb County Police. DeKalb County Police, and at least one in critical condition. Um, it happened around 4:30 p.m. Uh, in the block, uh, in the 3900 block of Flat Shoals Parkway. Fox you, Five watched. Uh, yeah. You said 4:30 p.m. Um, yeah. P.m. Oh. The early morning gun battle sent three people into the hospital. Maybe, did the investigators morning. maybe not get there till p.m.? It happened around 4.30 p.m. I think, yeah, I think maybe. they must meet a.m. Okay. It's early morning. Well, yeah, if, I hear, if I hear Waffle House gunfight, I usually think a.m. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it happened in the dark. Yeah. yeah. It, oh, yeah. I, there, I have no doubt in my mind that, like, yeah. that's this what is it, a, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, this is when the sun either has set or has not yet risen. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. No, yeah. Looking from the photos, I think they just miswrote it, and it uh, should as, be AM. As a formerly okay. young person, <laughs> Waffle House is exactly where you would go to get shot. Oh, my goodness. And also, Waffle House, that is not meant to slander you. <laughs> Please don't sue me. I um, object to the aspersions being cast upon Waffle House. <laughs> I am a huge fan. I support Waffle House during it. daytime hours. Um, so oh, anyway, but yeah. So yeah, I don't know. So I don't know, day or night. And sometimes it's just right. <laughs> um, so this makes me think of questions. Uh, there are lots of this. legal issues with this. Yeah. So so Certainly. 
what are some that jump out to you immediately? <laughs> okay, and some of these, murder. Th- some of them are <laughs> murder is first. The, yeah, yeah. first all the, all the criminal issues. <laughs> yeah, right. And then all of the potential civil issues that yeah. are going to emerge, whether. I don't know how safe this Waffle House is or what duty the Waffle House may have had to prov- to minimize the risk of shootings. Um, as much as I make fun of Waffle House's dangers at night, I, I mean, it's probably fairly uncommon to be, to, for that to be, there's first any, for, for Waffle House to have any foreseeability about a crime like that. Right. It's mm-hmm. probably some people who got emotional and did something really, really terrible. But you're saying so potentially someone could make it, the argument that, hey, this might be Waffle House's fault for creating an unsafe they're environment. Gonna, someone I would try. It would have to be very fact-specific to, to that particular location yes. and what's been going on around that location okay. and what they've done about it. Exactly. Huh. And maybe even if, if you're... Yes. They're gonna, a personal injury attorney somewhere is going to want to try to prove that Waffle House was negligent so they can get a verdict against Waffle House and get money right. for the estate. Really? Cause, well, because corporate pockets are big pockets. Yeah, and they have insurance speaking. policies. They're like the biggest actor in the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so, and a lot yeah. of, and if you're asking for a relatively low amount, a lot of them will just settle. It it's cheaper than paying than your lawyers. It. What's a relatively low amount? It's gonna, like it's gonna this. depend. It depends on the thing. Okay. Yeah. Like a hundred grand, or like. I'm not gonna throw a number out because okay. that would be a legal advice. It, it, yeah. <laughs> it, not, it, it would I, depend you know, on the circumstances. Non legal advice show. Be. Yeah. Um, so if if there's a if a billionaire got killed, it's a lot different amount potentially in damages than if like some un, a, someone a, who did a normal it, person, did like a 99 year old person with no mm. money who had no <laughs> earning ability gotcha. got like mm-hmm. killed. Um, okay. But, and there's also lots of other things. And I remember darkly, one of my friends who d- works at an injury law firm was showing me the standard settlement for various maimings and injuries. So you know, like these are bullet points we negotiate around. It's like a left eye is worth this much. An really? arm is worth that yeah. much. They have a they have a list of of body parts. That, it's mostly digital yeah, now, and, but yeah. And that wow. was a hu- wasn't it a huge controversy controversy with was it Ford maybe maybe when one of their cars kept exploding oh, or something was it the pinto yeah and, yeah and it came out that their attorneys had kind of drafted a guide for the settlement saying you know okay if this is the injury this is what we're willing oh to pay for God. it and people got very upset and i may Which be misremembering is, that but that's something i it's in my head from law school i'm getting nods that, yeah. that yes i'm right <laughs> like, um, <laughs> yeah but you have to weigh injuries because some injuries do impact your day-to-day life more than others and your ability right. to earn money yeah like you can you can as a lawyer, I can do my job with a lot of injuries. That's, like, right. I can that's do, insane, <laughs> yeah. though. That's a crazy concept that, hey, like you can get a different – I mean, I guess that makes but, sense. But like, yeah. there's a, I mm-hmm. like the idea that there's this codified list of like if you lose a left eye, it's not as important if you're right eye dominant or yeah, something. Like, yes. Yeah, so I, some things are worth more and less than others. I think yeah, right. right arms are worth more than left arms generally because people write with the right arm. Right. Though, yeah. Could you ballpark an average worth? Of I a body wish park? I could remember. Oh, okay. It is. Yeah, and I've never, I've never done personal injury. So I've, never, I've never had to calculate the value of an eye. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's got to be like eyes are low, dollars, eyes are probably right? lower value. It, it, it'd be hundreds surprising of less. Yeah, I mean, well, so what they're looking at is they're looking at something that they can quantify. Yeah. As far as what's the impact on your life? Yeah. And, and, and there is like there's a good concept yeah. of this because you want. It to be fairly standard across all cases, mm-hmm. so like people don't fair. get judgments not too skewed. So the insurance companies in particular, because they deal with more. Ca- most plaintiffs only get injured once in their life, whereas an insurance company deals with a gazillion claims. Right. So if they pay enough claims, it eventually standardizes out. So it makes it kind of more transparent for everyone else to know. And it, in some ways, it's actually good for the legal system because you can settle it without having to go to court. So if you know how much this generally impacts people, you can get your check and then not have to sue them and wait a year or two to go through the judicial system. Yeah, yeah. it helps with, with judicial economy and all that. But I, but I guarantee yeah. with this kind of Waffle House thing, this particular situation, there's probably some lawyer sizing up the damages. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and honestly, if it was if someone was negligent, then they should – if Waffle House was found – I use Waffle House as an example because they're in the story. But if they yeah. found out, like, hey, these dudes are coming by at six, whatever, at this time to do this thing, we know the they've, time, they've been coming all the time and they've been threatening yeah. people. And, and, and Waffle you know, House has, like, given them free food to, uh, to encourage them to keep coming, something yeah. like that. You uh, know, All those things could it, lead to, like, you should have known. It would be yeah. pretty it's out so there. It's so unlikely. <laughs> it's very unlikely, but so, it is so, a thing. Hold on. So, so paint for me the perfect situation. Let's say I the, get the, shot at Waffle House. I get shot in the arm, right? Yeah. And so yeah. I... 
I'm entitled to my left arm settlement, I hope. So, um, okay. what, what does Waffle House have to do, cut and dry? What would be a really, really great case for me that Waffle okay. House, I have proof of all these things that Waffle House Actually, did. I have, I have an example. If, if the suitor literally came to the Waffle House yeah. and told them, I'm going <laughs> to shoot these people when they come in at yeah. 4.30 okay. in your parking lot, and then they told everybody who worked there, and no one called the police. Gotcha. Or if... Or they're like, fuck you. It went like a further on, they yeah. made fun of him. <laughs> oh, you're afraid yeah. of getting shot? <laughs> <laughs> and then like... <laughs> and then moved on. And, like yeah. it, it would be like a, it would be yeah. like some, some monstrous indifference to yeah. like yeah. their like situation. Yeah. Or or another or the victim one. came up as like I'm afraid they're gonna shoot me, and no one did anything. Okay. Yeah. Or uh, another good example would be if you know maybe an employee of the Waffle House felt unsafe because of whatever, and they said to these people, "Hey, we're gonna give you free food if you like sit around the Waffle House and make sure things are okay, right?" And then they're kind of like bringing them in as like quote unquote security, kind of like that old I think it was a Rolling Stones concert where they hired hell's angels to be security and then when a hell's angel killed someone um you know suddenly a lot of people are in trouble because you're, wow. you're bringing them in as you as an agent yeah. essentially at that point so that could be another re- way oh, but, yeah, but yeah. again it's I really don't unlikely. think that's what happened. <laughs> I think this. Waffle yeah, I House so just either. happened to be where these people were. I think this and could ter- have, and people yeah. d- and terrible people did. And this and could have just, just as easily. Just but the people who did it did something terrible. It, it right. could have just as easily happened in in a parking lot or or anywhere else. At it's a Chick Fil A. Waffle House exactly. It, 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 it happened waffle, to be at a Waffle House. Waffle House's danger is for these situations that they're open twenty four hours a day. <laughs> that's really their key danger, is because a lot of. These kind of crimes tend to happen in the dark, and Waffle is open in the dark. In the dark, if you've <laughs> if you've been drinking, yep. yeah, yeah, so. stuff like that. That's it, partially why it's so great, though. You know, it's like oh, yeah. anything can happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I was in law school, with the Waffle House, you knew where the police were. The police were just always at the Waffle House. <laughs> it was very comforting. The, honestly, if I'm the DeKalb County um, police or, DeKalb, or whatever city it is, I would just like I'm just have officers at the Waffle House all the time. Oh, but there's yeah. so yeah, many do Waffle House do at eat. each location. Yeah, there's, there's a officer. lot of locations. Of yeah, Waffle House. honestly, or do you just have somebody doing a Waffle House beat, and it's like two yeah. officers that just drive That's a circuit true. of all the Waffle cool. Houses. Honestly, if we're, if we're maximally deploying your people, you, should, you could have a police there, and that kind of if we move like a police precinct kind of into or next to the Waffle House <laughs> because you're probably gonna go there anyway. It's probably not for murder, but someone probably got into like a fight or, well, had, a, or had a really a lot of di- a lot of dine and dashes coming out of Waffle Houses. Yeah, yeah, really. I got I got a lot of those when I was a public defender. Wow, you might a as well put the precincts dashes. in the Waffle House. If I ever see, you know, like <laughs> yeah. when you see like a Pizza Hut, but it's also a Taco Bell or whatever. Yeah, it's if like I a Waffle House, waffle slash, house police slash police department. <laughs> yes, because they're there anyway. Why have all the police cars? Why have all, all this thing just centralized? Yeah. <laughs> It's like we all know. Just have them walk over, or, the, I or, love or this. put like, some sort of door between them. Because they're gonna walk right through. It's fantastic. Yep. As trusty, I, I do like Waffle House. Having said all that, I, I love Waffle House. It's one of the reasons I moved to the South. <laughs> don't sue me, Waffle House. I'm. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever had a waffle from there. I've only got like. Oh, uh, you're missing out. What you yeah. do is you get the waffle, and then you get the the chocolate chips and the peanut butter chips, and then you wow. put butter and syrup on it, and, and then, then you, you eat that, and, and then and then you get a side of bacon, and you break that up, <laughs> and you put it on the waffle. I love America. Yeah. <laughs> Kathy, Kathy, we had this really funny joke about Waffle House where, you, uh-huh. where like, they're like several menu items you don't need teeth to enjoy. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of true. You could just have a gum a disproportionate amount of their dishes. They have excellent grits. <laughs> yeah. And you could you could like eat grits. grits with a straw. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> As trustee, how do I deal with the sibling that has taken what does not belong to her? I am trustee and one of four beneficiaries from my father's trust, and all assets are to be split equally. One sibling took several valuables listed in the trust that belong to all four and will not return them. She has also taken my father's ashes and will not return them over. So I may fulfill his wish of joining my mother in the veteran's cemetery. I have several requests. Uh, I have made several requests, uh, but with no luck. I'm not sure how to proceed. Um, what do I do? Sewer. Sewer. That's okay. okay. Yeah, so, so the ups, okay. Well, that's the most blunt force way to do it um, depending on the value of the property if it's like under um 15,000 or so you can you can bring it in magistrate court yourself as trustee against her for what conversion. is magistrate oh this is georgia sorry in any state really but it's like small claims court more or less okay um you can bring a claim without an attorney there's no rules of professional conduct if you feel really comfortable doing it yourself you can is Having that said all like, that, don't. This is dumb. Is that kind of like Judge Judy, right? It's She's closer to Judge Judy. <laughs> uh, Judge Judy is technically it's arbitration. Ar- it's only yeah, binding it's arbitration. Arbit- yeah. 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 But yeah, 
but if you walk into magistrate court or any small claims court in America, you will see a real murderer's row of people yelling at each other in front of a judge and a judge who was very, very patient, who I honestly yes. think they should allow the judge to drink during the hearing. Because like, that's like, they should have like a break where it's like, do you need anything? Can I get yeah. you a cigarette, a drink? Because it is, it, it is enduring. So, so if it's a couple hundred dollars, I take her to small claims court to go get my money. Um, the yeah. judge makes a decision. Yeah. Because it, yeah, it's unclear. Cause the assets are a smaller value. Because it's unclear to me that the value was actually financial value or like sentimental value. Mm -hmm. But you can. In, but what really she can also do is, since she's a trustee, she can also use trust assets, including trust funds, to pay for counsel um, right. and just sue her in regular court. Oh, okay. And if she prevails, she can probably get attorney's fees from her sister's share. Sweet. Um, so I would probably recommend that. Give her sister one final demand, or Kyra Council sends one final demand letter. I'm going to sue you. It's going to be with your own money. You yes. Need, you need to return this. And if you don't, we will file suit, and here's what we'll be seeking. Yes. Hmm. So assuming she's, and this is one of the, and yeah, and this is one of the reasons I don't like siblings serving as trustee over other siblings, because you have these weird dynamics where you have to sue your sister or your brother. Yeah. Ideally, right. if they could have found someone who was more neutral, like a professional fiduciary, an attorney, uh, bank wealth management department to do this, it would be a lot easier without, because I imagine one of the dynamics that's playing out with the sister who's not giving the things that she's pissed off at something that happened with the sister or the parents. So yeah, she would, I, she would have given it to a neutral person probably, but not to her sister. <laughs> yeah. Like this is my dice set because dad said that this was mine. I feel like, pretty, yeah. yeah there's there's yeah. all situations like this or like that sister who has stuff. like, I took care of my dad. I took yeah. care of them when they were right. sick or I... You got so many. You got so much money from them before. Blah blah. blah. People right. are. She's upset about something. Probably. I doubt it's like complete. Her. I doubt her anger is completely unfounded. Right. But it's, probably it's not. It's not pure malice. It's there's always more to it. Yeah. Right. So I, mean, I know we're probably from the one person side. Just trust me, tell you ask the question. But there's probably something going on the other side. So the sister also needs to be sensitive to that, and hopefully they can just settle it yeah. before they. I, it, it, the reason it might already be too bad at this point, but hopefully, if, hopefully, if they, even if, if even before, ideally, even before they involve an attorney and they go through all the steps, they can have one more come yeah. to Jesus moment where they have like with maybe with a therapist or someone yeah. who's neutral, yeah. Yeah. who's like able to, to help them process like their emotions to kind of work well, through it. And the thing is, in a lot of situations like this, getting that letter from an attorney is often enough to make somebody who that's is, true who is acting emotionally and unreasonably to to get them to calm down and say okay this is actually real this will have consequences right i'm not just arguing with my yeah. sister i'm gonna lose and 10 you, years. Have to, like, you have to know it, your sister you at know, that point. it kind of put it kind of really uh pushes the gravity of the situation and the actual consequences that are here yeah you have to know your sister it's just, um, i think many people will get calmed down by it and maybe they'll get more irate absolutely yeah, so like, like, oh, you're going to bring a lawyer into this? Well, fine. I'm going to get my own lawyer. If the sister has her own money, she's just doing it out of spite. Mm -hmm. she, right. and she, she buckles down. You have to know your sister. You probably have enough history with this person to know if you back her into a corner, she'll come out swinging. Or if she's the kind of person who will calm down and make come to her senses. Or if it's mm -hmm. like thing where you let it sit for a couple weeks and then reapproach it, she'll calm down. You know you know what's kind of shocking but I think to me? I think the trustee sister should consider – uh, depending on her sister's relationship and what happens, there might be a counterintuitive be nice to her strategy that mm -hmm. might get her to, c to come back to the table. Especially <laughs> if, it, if it is assets that are not necessarily valuables, but more sentimental. Yeah, it's like a photo the, you know, album. The fact or, that it's over the yeah. over the, the, the remains, the, yeah. the cremated yeah. remains, yeah. that would indicate to me that maybe this is more of an emotional like mourning process response. So maybe you want to address it from that yeah. angle too before you get too adversary. But definitely know your legal rights, but there might be really, yeah. you might be able to no, fix this relationship-wise. Yeah. Yeah. Know your rights, be, be ready to pursue them, but don't, <laughs> don't just, like you don't necessarily want to jump into that. Yeah. Right away. I said sue cavalierly at the beginning, but <laughs> you, should, you should let a build up. You, you should yeah. really know you've played all your options first that right. were non, um, litig or non court based. Yeah. I, I always think it's so interesting. I mean, from from an, from a layman's perspective, I always feel like law is this thing where it's like, oh, you know, this is a, you know, it's a cut and dry thing. Here are the rules and blah blah blah. And if you just know the rules, like that's kind of how I thought about it. And I think it's super interesting that with each, with, as we do more of these questions, it's more like, hey, like you know, 
be a human. Like this, if yeah. we do this, she'll probably react in this very human way, and we don't yes. want her to do that. So yeah. that's exactly. Like, people need. I'll say this with the sister in particular, with everyone. People will feel more buy-in if you give them a soft landing. If you give them a way to save face mm -hmm. without having to go to court, you might salvage a relationship with her. Cool. Absolutely. Cool. Sweet. <laughs> Arkansas man gets two life terms, 835 years for killing a police officer. Um, Western Memphis, Arkansas. As it's... What? I, I, I lived, used to live near West, Memphis. West, West Memphis, Memphis is West fairly Memphis. dangerous. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's the, uh, that's where that, there was that famous case out of West Memphis. Yes. They used to yeah. have the... Uh, like the first 24, they had like a disproportionate amount of episodes. I saw more than one episode was, in West Memphis. Was that the, mes the West Memphis 3? Yeah, that happened in West Memphis. That was the, 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 the yeah. satanic panic thing, right? Yeah. Okay. But it's literally like across the river in Memphis. Where you go there and it's 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 a letdown from that. Even a, no hate on Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a drop off from Memphis. Memphis has seen better days. Gotcha. An Arkansas man has been sentenced to two life terms plus 835 years in prison for the fatal shooting of an off-duty police officer in northeast Arkansas. Uh, DeMarcus Donald Parker, 27, was convicted Tuesday, September 8th by a Crittenden County jury of first-degree murder, illegally shooting a weapon from a vehicle, and 21 related charges um, okay. in the April 2018 shooting death of Forest City Officer Oliver Johnson, according to court documents. An attorney for Parker did not immediately return a phone call seeking comment on Wednesday. Prosecutors have said that Parker uh, was shot at rival gang members outside of Johnson's home in West Memphis when the officer was struck in the stray of bullets. Um, investigators have said Johnson was likely not the target of the gunfire. So yeah, so so gang member shoots at opposing gang members, uh, accidentally hits a cop. Uh, two life sentences in prison. I thought that was super interesting. Oh, I thought we'd want to two life about. sentences plus, plus eight hundred and thirty five years. Eight hundred and thirty five years. See, yeah. They see what they've they've macked up that time. <laughs> they won. Yeah. This is like a good sentence. It's like a solid sentence. Yeah. Uh, two pretty, lives plus eight hundred thirty five yeah. years. It's a beefy we'll one. reincarnate you. So you'll serve another life sentence and then eight hundred thirty five years. So and, and I guess what I would want to know is you know I know in, in Georgia the sentencing is done by the judge. Mm -hmm. um, the judge determines what the ultimate sentence is going to be even after a jury trial. Um, I'm sure there's exceptions to that, but. Um, this territory. isn't this isn't for legal advice. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't know what they do in Arkansas. Um, it might be a state where they do jury sentencing, where the jury actually decides hmm. the sentence. The states gotcha. do that. Yeah, that is the thing. Okay. I know. Uh, I know Texas does that, huh. or at least they used to. Um, so, what you're probably looking at here, right? They had the 21 related charges. Mm -hmm. When I first heard those numbers, my my immediate thought was, you know, there's two things that could bump that up that high. Uh, one would be there's multiple people. That are our targets. Gotcha. And Who's then number two crowd. would be multiple yeah. shots. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so with, that, that's where 835 came from. Right. Some sort so of what that tells me adding is adding up all those years. Right. So, if so they've three, got if there's three mm -hmm. potential targets, he fired sh seven shots. That's 21 counts of hey he attempted murder. Me. Attempted wow. murder. Maybe aggravated some assault. Using a firearm or yeah, I would guess. Um, you know, so 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 what will often happen, mm -hmm. and this is especially true in cases where you know, so the state will often add a lot of charges. Right, they'll charge everything they can think of um, because they don't want to um, just charge the most serious because if they don't get that. They by charging something. everything else that's included, then they might get something lower. Yeah. Um, and in fact, there, there have been cases in the news where they've only charged, like, the big one, and then when they lost, um, you know, they got in a lot of trouble. And that happened with um, a couple, like, police officers that were accused yeah. of things, stuff like that. Wow. When, when, when okay. your defendant walks out, people do Right, not people are it. not um, <laughs> happy about that. So what they'll often do is they'll do a charge of aggravated murder for... I'm sorry, a charge of, of attempted murder for each potential target um, per fi per shot fired. Wow. So uh, I can think of an example of a, of a case uh, that happened in Chicago. It was a, a teenager was killed accidentally in crossfire, and I think there were two defendants that were arrested, and it was something like like 185 counts so, when wow. they were arrested. Were they alleging essentially that after each time he pulled the trigger, he formed separate intent? Each time you pulled it, would it. Be each act. Yeah, each time you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you had the same. It was like multiple acts with the same intent, and and you know it. it okay, so just yeah. one consistent intent. And again, one. I'm I'm talking <laughs> you know out of my rear end on this without <laughs> oh, more facts. No, yeah. Um, but but yeah. yes, often you know it'll be 
for each individual. So like a good example would be if somebody is resisting arrest and there's four officers trying to arrest them, well, that's going to be four counts of wow, resisting arrest. Really? One, one per officer. That's crazy that's to think happen. about. And, and what will often happen is, is prior to a trial, they'll give you a plea deal that'll be something less. But if you take it to a trial, that's when you start looking at more of these long, long sentences where they rack it all consecutive because it's, it's called a trial tax, right? And it's nothing, it's not in the law, it's not anything like that. It's just kind of something that you just see. Um, because generally speaking, if it's, if it's a bad case, more facts come out um, th that might not be helpful. Um, another thing that could impact that sentence being that long would be is if this person had a prior record. And then you could be looking at, at elevated yeah, let's not elevated that. things. I have two questions. Um, the first question is: Is there a uh, is there a drawback to potentially overstepping? Right. I threw the book at the sky. You know, we have all these uh, things. You know, is there a potential of overstepping? And then the other question is: From like an idealist perspective of like you know, like looking at like what the law is supposed to do for people. Do you guys agree with how that system is? You know, hey, um, or do you think that it's like kind of a corrupt usage of this code of laws yeah. that we've created. I'm going to punt on the first part. Yeah. <laughs> like, I have a thought on the second part. <laughs> um, right. I've, I've never worked as a prosecutor, so I, I can't speak from experience on this, but generally speaking, um, you know, there, there could be a slight downside if it goes to a trial because if I'm really stretching on the most serious charge, that would give the defense attorney ammunition to say this, this is fun. this is being done out of spite and out of malice. It's, this is a yeah. bogus. This is a show court. You know, you can make a big it, deal out of the fact that, like, you know, they've charged this person with malice murder. Mm -hmm. Look at this. There's no malice. This was obviously if you have a very sympathetic accident. defendant. Yeah. Like if it's like an old lady and you've overcharged her. I, th I could see the jury getting mad at it. Yeah, so it's kind of one of those things where like, if, if you really stretch and you and you can't prove it, then then yes, there could be a bit of a downside. Mm -hmm. um, I think practically, I think there's more of a, there is more of a benefit to a prosecutor to just file everything and just kind of see what sticks. Yeah. Um, you're, you're making more work for yourself because you then have to go through each one like line by line. It's going to make a lot of stuff to go through logistics wise but um you're you're and and for the da if you know you can say you know they've been charged with 87 counts and that for the jury it's gonna be like oh my god like what did yeah. they do they yeah did bad. i think for juries there must be some degree i know it's civil that happens but like they look at all these charges and they're like this person might even be sympathetic right or they might feel justified or the vic or the person they shot was terrible right. um and they're sort of like let's just pick one of those lower ones and give them like five years and send them on their way so yeah the, you do you do run that risk that is a good point i hadn't thought about that um if you're if you're doing a prosecution and you do um different charges you'll get you'll get compromised verdicts where you know you might have ended up um with a conviction for for the DA, um, but you end up with a compromise verdict. One of your reduced ones. So say gotcha. it's like a, a murder charge, but you've also included voluntary manslaughter as a lesser you know offense. You know they they might have eventually landed on on murder if they've been made to deliberate longer. Yeah. But they might also do that compromise and go down to voluntary manslaughter. Yeah, might as well. And, that, that, and that was something I that as a defense know. attorney you worry about too, because if you're thinking, well, this is a terrible case. There's no way they can prove this. Well, well, you might wind up with you know, where, where you're hoping for maybe even a hung jury, mm -hmm. right? And and, a, hung and jury? a hung jury would mean that they don't come to any agreement. No verdict. Gotcha. There's no verdict. You might be hoping for that because then that... The prosecutor you know, might not try it they again. They might not try it again or or they might come back to you with a much better offer mm -hmm. for a plea. So you might be hoping for that, but because they have all these lesser included offenses to choose from, they might just go ahead and convict on something lower that's still really bad for your client. And mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think that that's... Because I see with a lot, of, I see it probably more with like sympathetic defendants, particularly. Mm -hmm. I imagine police defendants. Um, but a lot of times with women, there was like a lot of in yeah. domestic violence. Hit, you're, there were a lot of juries going back, coming back with compromise verdicts. Yeah. Um, because they're like the the, the, vic, the person that she she killed in self defense was a jerk, um, and mm -hmm. the jury was like. We'll give her a firearms conviction. She used right. a firearm uh, unauthorized and send her on her, and, but sus yeah. suspended sentence and send her out. Yeah, so it's like yeah. a way, like a jury can say, like, you know, we don't, 
like we don't think you did what you did like what you did was wrong but we feel like there might be some justification for it but not not enough for us to say nothing but we're going to give you a lesser charge we don't approve of your behavior but but we understand there's a lot of winks and nods i think in some higher in some particular Mm -hmm. circumstances so so because juries are people like if you see a person in that circumstance you're like oh no yeah if they're they're more and more like you like which is why there's certain biases towards like middle class white juror being people defendants part because juries tend to be more middle class white people um, and, but and if you can like identify me, like, with the person yeah. more. Yeah. So if, you can, if, you can, if you can somehow play that exactly right, like even the, the O.J. Simpson jury, they might have sympathized with them because of race. I mean, they said they did. But like, if you kind of build in those kind of things and you can create that kind of vibe with the jury, they might let you go because they're human beings and they now understand what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> um, from 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 a perspective of idealism and like you know the the intent of like what the law is supposed to do. Do you guys agree that this is like yeah this is the system this is it working well or oh it's you, terrible. Do I don't even terrible? do criminal law. I doesn't yeah. yeah, but like what it. I'll, I'm curious about J- I'll, I'll, I'll curious about James' <laughs> take on it. But like the yeah. system seems like we have too many things that are illegal, like just a stunning amount of things that are illegal that we don't need to make illegal. Um, which also increases the amount of contact people have with the police. Yeah. Um, and also, the w- it doesn't actually look after victims at all. Like every single litigate, every single criminal case is like the state versus defendant or the people versus whatever your state is. And at no point is the victim there because they're just a witness to the state's case. And one thing other countries have experimented with, and some places in the US are experimented with, is restorative justice and actually mm-hmm. having a meeting between the victim and the defendant to make the victim whole, um, which is, there's data emerging, up, but it tends to lower recidivism rates um, because the defendant actually has to acknowledge what they've done to the person. And most people feel like shit after they've acknowledged what they've done. Yeah. It was like stealing a bike and the, def- and the person, I was reading an example of it from like San Francisco, I want to say some dude sold one's bike the woman asked him to paint, uh, make a painting of Tinkerbell for her. It was a very random thing she wanted to make mm-hmm. whole. But he really? really threw himself into it and made her like a kick-ass painting and he never, <laughs> and he never re-offended. And he didn't That's go to jail. His life cool. was not ruined. So, yeah. But there, there, should, there should be more space in the justice system for things that make victims whole and actually try to lower crime yeah. as opposed to ruining people's lives right. and then making them... Very few people's lives are better after being incarcerated. Right. right. Tossing them into a for profit <laughs> prison system that doesn't focus on reform. It, yeah. it doesn't on... actually make us safer. Right. It, mm-hmm. it, in fact, it probably makes us less safe because if we then take those people back and dump them into usually high crime communities, whether they're rural communities or urban communities, and we make those communities even unsafer. So we have this weird cycle of crime, mm-hmm. usually of the same groups of people. Like most crime is committed by a very small percentage of the population that just keeps reoffending. yeah and and we never actually address that i think that's super interesting the 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 idea that instead of you know hey you violated like society's laws and therefore will totally ruin your life instead of hey you violated this person's laws you guys why don't you say you're sorry for really for non-violent offense of the particular start, yeah. start by saying you're sorry yeah, and then let's go from there. And, That's amazing. And let the I've system never make people better. Obviously, yeah. you shot, if you killed somebody. Yeah, send you to the justice system. Mm-hmm. But even then, there's I think there's a case in Florida where a family essentially forgave the man who killed their daughter, um, who was her, 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 her the daughter's ex boyfriend, and the judge took it into consideration and gave him a thirty year sentence instead of a life sentence. So because mm-hmm. the, ju- the family told him like, we want him to go out, you'll say well, I think he was seventeen or he was a teenager, mm-hmm. but like. We want, we want him to go out in, into the world again. Yeah. But we doesn't want, now he's made us whole, he told us what happened, all the information we need to know about it. Yeah. And so there might be some room wow. for stuff like that to have kind of actual mea culpas mm-hmm. or come to Jesus moments with defendants and not throw away the key, and, we've done our job. Because and it's and that does for happen. Done your job. And that does happen yeah. as well. And, you know, Georgia does have laws about what the victim's rights are. Um, they have a right to notice of certain things. They have a right to be there at court for certain things. They have a right to make statements. Again, never worked as a prosecutor. I never had to worry about this just as far as it was more just kind of I would have to give the, the DAs enough notice before I wanted to do something. Yeah. Um, and they would check with the victims in the case. And a lot of times, you know, if there's a, a plea negotiation, the victim would have a right to weigh in on that. Um, and they would have a right to make a statement as well. So they, they do have some rights, but but at the end of the day, I think what 
what our system doesn't do well that others do, um, I think, you, like you said, you get less recidivism when you treat people like human beings. Um, when you treat them as a, as a person who made a mistake or, or a person who was in a bad situation and made a bad decision, right, and you, you treat them as a human, you help them get back to where they need to be. But I think what we have um, a lot of times here, I mean, I can count in, in my two years as a public defender, I, mean, I can probably count on on my on my fingers the number of, of cases I got where it was this person's first arrest um, most people that I dealt with would be coming in over and over again um, and they would have an arrest record going back to when they were a teenager so I think what we wind up doing is we we have these laws and we have enforcement that pulls people into the system at a super young age and that just sets them up to have it so much harder for the rest of their life exactly and a big thing too is when you're in jail when you're in prison I mean I most of my clients would tell me the drugs in prison were, were better and cheaper than on the outside. Wow. So, and, and then there's the, there's the inherent risk of when you're in prison of, of being attacked. Like it's just, it's not a good place. So I think what we have is we have these laws that are set up to be very punitive. And there are things where, where society, there, there should be some punitive aspect. Oh, of course. But, but we, yeah. we are so focused on the punitive aspect. Um, that the human kind of gets lost. Versus the human. And yeah. I think it's because we look at it as... You know, instead of an opportunity to rehabilitate a person, um, we look at it as something that we have to. It's almost like another thing they have to just pay for to warehouse someone, and they try to do that for as little as possible. And and there are a lot of people in the justice system that are that work hard to to push it towards the rehabilitation, but just the the system that they're working in is still so punitive based that it's it's just it's tough. Yeah, and the polit- I feel sympathetic for politicians because. If you get 100 people who've committed a crime, you, re- you rehabilitate 99 of them, but one of them then goes on to do something right. terrible, right. The, it looks, everyone it looks will bad. blame you. And, yeah. and I think there is a, a portion of a lot of this, too, where, where you know, it, it's not that the system is broken. It's, you know, the system is doing what it was designed to do. It was just designed to do something very bad. Yes. Um, you know, you look at, at, you know, the different intersections of different, issues that are going on and when these different laws were passed and, and you can see things that were criminalized um for other purposes yes right, right. um so you know the classic example would be looking at there used to be a huge difference in sentencing between powder cocaine and crack cocaine um and it was specifically because well all right you can't say it was because but you know the argument is that they they made crack cocaine much more heavily penalized because they were using it to crack down on communities where it was people of color and people of lower income, whereas powder cocaine is more expensive. You know, you've got your guys on Wall Street, right. you know, bumping rails in the bathroom. Jordan Belfort. Yeah. Law firm. <laughs> law firm. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind I'll of throw, a I'll throw pot, law pot kettle thing here. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, so that's, that's kind of something that happens, right? You know, a, a lot of drug policy. You see a lot of people in prison for... For drug po- for drug crimes that where there, there really isn't a victim, right? Yeah. And and sometimes drug cases do have victims, right? The families are victims because they're losing a family member to drugs, and they're losing and there's potentially an income earner or that just a too. participant. And there's and there's property damage, and there's a million things like like. Don't get me wrong, drugs are bad. Yeah. Um, well, you know, but, but all right, they're bad for a different reason. Drug addiction is bad, drug and it addi- causes if, if, a lot of harm to a lot of people. If the drug addiction is harming the person, yeah. then it's bad. But if, if you if you're living your life great with I don't know, yeah. many people have drug addictions that I say it cynically. But if a drug addiction is not affecting your life badly, it, mm-hmm. you, you can somehow maintain a cocaine right. addiction with holding that <laughs> a job, being a great PTA mm-hmm. soccer dad. But I, mean, yeah. I think yeah. what we yeah. wind up it's doing rare, is but it theoretically yeah. could happen. What, what we wind up doing is our system just isn't built to treat it as a health issue. It's built to treat yeah. it as a criminal issue. So if, if you're getting busted for low-level drug offenses, well, the first thing they're going to do is, you know, they're not going to, like, throw you to prison for your first drug offense unless you have a bunch of drugs. Right. Um, you know, you're going to be on probation, and yeah. you're going to have to take a substance abuse evaluation, but but those aren't that hard to get through. And then you're on probation, and they're, like, checking up on you all the time, and if you slip, it's very easy to go to prison. And they're looking for other crimes. And, and now you're a felon. Right. So when you're looking for a job, it, it's one. a lot harder. Well, Georgia, and you can't you can't vote in a lot of places. It gets it gets 
It's rough. Georgia's rules are actually kind of fascinating. There's some data. Like, they had to remove the box thing where you have to, like, state you're a criminal. Granted, mm-hmm. I think probably... But it, what it's done weirdly, it, not, not weirdly, pre- entirely predictably, is that once you stop asking people about their criminal history, they will just make assumptions based on race and gender yeah. and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. now now hiring of black people to assume all black men are criminals in hiring because right. you have no other right. metric to go by. So Yeah, so I think <laughs> I think end of the day it the system would be better served to treat it as more of a, a health yeah. issue. We need to get a hand yeah, if we get a handle on drugs and yeah. my, and intervene successfully for yeah. minor crimes, I think we would generally be able to reduce our criminal footprint. Yeah, I would absolutely. Need. Absolutely. Wow. You, you can tell you can tell high school now, teaching high school, you can tell like people who have intervention in the system. If you can grab them at that level and turn their lives around, which isn't even that difficult for a lot of people. Yeah. You really are like, here's an extra hundred dollars so you can make sure you pay your light bill without having to participate in the drug economy. Wow. Yeah. That yeah, would probably huge. Yeah. Because I because I mean many people who did illegal things because their parents couldn't do, work stuff. functional. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> it's crazy to hear, you know, to like actors in the system be like, hey, yeah, the system is fundamentally not, I mean, it's I not broken. Ask, I think if like you lawyers, I mean, a lot yeah. of them would be like, oh, the criminal system's, Messed lots up. of systems need reform, but I think the criminal systems has such higher stakes because you're literally Decided putting people away. Well, such, a big par- <laughs> such a big percentage of our population is either incarcerated or has been incarcerated and dealing with all that backlash. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a huge issue, and it's a very hard issue for politicians to address because essentially what they're saying is i think we should go easier on criminals yeah, right and and voters don't like that high right. risk low reward high risk <laughs> low reward because you can't tell because it's hard to tell about the crime you prevented because right. it didn't happen right <laughs> yeah and you won't feel oftentimes when you, when you cut when you increase resources for kids and some of them lower you won't feel the crime rate drop for years right so mm-hmm. you, even then you won't know no one could uh, no it's like yeah. it's like a defense spending like they're so, always like yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and we've kind of like gotten down our like progressive ranty rabbit hole <laughs> yes. here but yeah, you yeah. know the, you know we're getting away from the this crime which was a violent crime that put a lot of people oh, in danger yeah. and, and a lot of these arguments aren't that. as applicable to that but something right? quite led up to it what what gets yeah. a person to a point where they're willing to get in a car drive past a group of people that they don't like because they're in a different club right and open fire Yes. Without any has without without any fear for the people behind them, right? right. What gets someone to that point? Because I don't feel like that's a normal part of the human condition. There's something to that, and yeah. you know, and and I guess it's that part of me that thinks that you know people aren't fundamentally bad or or evil or anything like that. People get to bad places, right? Yes. So I think we have to look at you know when I look at a case like this, what I want to know is all right, what 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 was it like for you growing up, right? right. Like what did you have to do? Like how how did your brain develop? Right, because if if you if you're growing up and you have all this trauma going around you, it's really hard. You know, your your brain chemistry changes, mm-hmm. and and I'm basing this fully on assumptions. I have no idea what this guy's life was. Well, yeah. I can ask him. But, yeah, yeah, I, I'm but, gonna bet it's not great. No, that's okay. I, I would yeah. assume it's not great. I think yeah. that's super interesting. Um, I know we've we can talk, labored on it. But we no, should you're move totally on. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool, guys. Uh, with that, that is the end of this episode of Let's Talk About Death and Taxes, guys. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, make sure you let us know. Post a comment, you guys. If you have a question about estate planning or you have any reaction to anything that we talked about today, post it in the comments. Or also, if you have a specific estate planning question about um, your situation. You can email us. Um, also, you can email us a voice memo. And that email is what, Stephen? Um, questions at let's talk about death and taxes.com. Fantastic. Um, guys, we would love to help you with your estate plan, especially if you live in the Atlanta area. If you live outside of Atlanta, we'll put you in contact with the right people, but we serve people in Atlanta. Um, so, yeah, give us a call. Our number is 404 939 7562. Um, and uh, you can also email us uh, at uh, what's the um, best info email? at. Um, Modern estate planning or info at Yeah, sweet. Fine. Um, send us an email or just message our page or uh, you know post a comment and uh, we will hit you up. Yeah. And if you're thinking to yourself, why well, live in somewhere kind of close to Atlanta? Should I reach out? Yes. yes. Reach out. <laughs> <laughs> we're, not, not we're, not, we're not. We're not limited to the perimeter. That's yeah. true. That's oh true. yeah, we, we're yes, we're in the burbs now. So yes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Guys, thanks so much for watching. Uh, if you're listening on a podcasting app, make sure you go ahead and give us a five star review. That would really, really help us out. Guys, have a great day. Bye bye.